Not such a long, long time ago, when life was moving really slow, locked up in our houses all in a row. Well, I can remember if I cried when Dan Old nearly died. Something touched me deep inside the day we were coronified. Oh, we were singing bye bye. We were scattered to houses. We learned a few lessons, and what church is about is. More than just singing songs and all to cause. It's about a church without walls. It's about a church without walls. Do you believe in the great command? Love your neighbor and her man to pray for all the A on your hashtag. Well, I know that you're in love with God, 'cause I saw you out in your front yard. The people came and went. It was a glorious FYM event, and we were singing bye bye. We were scattered to houses. We learned a few lessons, and what church is about is more than just singing songs and all to call. It's about a church without walls. It's about a church without walls. Well, howdy, and thanks for inviting us into your home or into your life. Whether you're watching this with a bunch of other folks in an online service hosted by someone here at Calvary, or you're streaming it later. Whether you're living here locally in Happy Valley, or you're down in North Carolina, all the way across the country in Chico, California, hey Robin and Terry, or you're somewhere else around the globe, we appreciate your trust and your time. We're in week six of a series that we've called Summer School. We believe that there are some big life lessons that we've been given by God that are worth revisiting, worth holding on to as we head into the next chapter of our story. We've already heard some great messages from some of the other leaders at Calvary, and it's my privilege to share another lesson today. So let me give you a sneak peek. This this is where we're headed.、Um, God's got a plan to give you rest for your soul. In a day and age marked by trauma and difficulties, God has a plan to restore and renew His people. So that's where we're headed. And I hope that you find this useful. That is the promise that we've been working from in this series, from Jeremiah six sixteen. Jeremiah writes, "Thus says the Lord: Stand by the roads and look, ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls." To get us started, we're gonna. Do a little exercise, a little participation from you. So wherever you are, I'd like you to close your eyes,、uh, unless you're driving. If you're behind the wheel of a car or operating heavy machinery, please, please, please keep your eyes open. But for the rest of us, we're going to close our eyes and take three deep breaths. And as we do that, I want you to pay attention to your body. What do you feel? What do you notice about your body? So let's do that. Start at the top. What do you What do you notice or feel in your head, your neck, your shoulders? Make your way down through your your chest and your your belly, your arms, your legs, all the way down to your feet. How does your body feel? What do you notice? What What about your mental state, your emotional center? What do you notice about the way you feel? Do you feel tired or tense? Do you, do you feel discouraged or depressed? Do you do you feel stressed or or struck stuck like you're struggling to make progress? Last week I had the opportunity to hear Dr. Henry Cloud speak at the Global Leadership Summit. He said that in late June 
of last year, 2020, the Center for Disease Control reported that 40% of adults in the United States were struggling, reported struggling with mental health or substance abuse. I'm not sure things have gotten a whole lot better over the last year. So I'm going to give you a list. And, and just as you listen to this, pay attention. Have you ever felt any of these? Depression or mood problems, trauma or stressors, addiction, substance abuse. Have you felt anxiety, dealt with relationship struggles that come with personality issues, food struggles, sleep struggles, sexual problems? You hear that list and let me ask you, how do you feel right now? Do you feel the weight of any of those things? You might be saying, well, I wasn't, Stace, until you started talking about it, so thanks. We've got a lot of words for it. Maybe you call it burnout, COVID brain, uh, mental fog. A few weeks ago, Pastor Brett called it languishing. I don't know how you're feeling, but as we come to the end of summer and the start of a brand new school year, I can tell you I'm feeling it. And many of the people that I talk to are feeling it. We're feeling tired, worn down. We're looking for a break. We're looking for some answers and some relief. We're a bit like the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Now, you, you might know Elijah from some of his greatest hits, confronting the evil Israeli king Ahab, prophesying a three-year drought, fleeing to the desert where God sends ravens to him every day with bread to feed him. It's about the only thing ravens are good for. There are mir miracles of ridiculous proportion and provision involving a widow woman and her jars of oil. And then there's the backstory to where we're going today. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a worship war. He says, let's each build an altar, prepare the sacrifice, and call on our God. And whichever God answers by fire, that's the true God. You may know the story, but if not, I'll go ahead and spoil the ending for you. Baal's guys go first, all 400 of them. They're dancing, shouting, praying, worshiping cutting themselves and calling on Baal. And when he doesn't answer, because he's not a real God, Elijah starts to trash talk. Hey guys, shout louder. Maybe, maybe he's sleeping or, or maybe he's busy doing something and oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe he's on the toilet and he's not done with his business yet. When they're done dancing around, Elijah steps up rebuilds the altar of the Lord. He lays the sacrifice and then he instructs the attendants to douse the sacrifice, the wood and the altar with water repeatedly. So much water gathers around that there's a trench that, that just fills up with, with water around the altar like a moat. Elijah prayed and the Lord answered, sending flames from heaven that consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the altar, even licked up the water in the trench. Then he commanded everyone who wanted to serve the Lord to kill the 400 prophets of Baal right then and there in one brutal, bloody day of judgment on the sin of Israel, and it marked a renewal of a, an ancient covenant between God and man. That's his finest hour. It's his Super Bowl victory. It's his national championship, his Olympic gold medal. In the time of his country's greatest need, Elijah stepped into the gap and delivered the message from God that the people needed to hear. At great risk of personal harm, he stood alone in the face of his enemies, staring down death, and he called down the fire of God. But the next chapter didn't come as expected. There was no gold medal ceremony, no ticker tape parade, no great awakening, no national appreciation, no sweeping revival. Let's see what actually happened. This is 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 4. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life like one of them by this time tomorrow. 
Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now. O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Let me pray before we get too far, far down the road on this. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word, for the, the brutal honesty that we find in the pages of Scripture, for the, the stories that you tell us to, to draw our own stuff up to the surface. Would you breathe life into these words today? Would you speak to us? We want to connect with you. We want to hear from you. So teach us. Holy Spirit, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've ever felt like Elijah here in chapter 19, you need to know that you're not alone. Even on the heels of a great victory, Elijah hit the bottom. His tank was empty, but the test wasn't over. Last week, as we watched the closing session of the Global Leadership Summit, we heard Albert Tate ask just this arresting question. He said, what if 2020 and all of the things that we experienced in that global pandemic, what if 2020 was the lesson and 2021 is the test? What if all of the things that we learned by going through that global pandemic was a lesson that God was trying to teach us and now is the test? See, we're all gonna be tested. And sometimes we won't have anything left in the tank, no reserves to meet the demands of the day. Yet we have this promise from God that we can find rest for our souls. So let me ask you, after doing that little reflection, how's your soul right now? On a scale of one to 10, what do you have left in the tank? If you're taking notes, write it down. On a scale of one to 10, I have blank left in the tank. I don't know how you feel right now, but I do know that I've got good news for you. Here's the good news. God makes provision for you in your time of need. But, doesn't it always seem like there's a but? But God's provision doesn't always show up in ways that we expect. Let's check out a little bit more of Elijah's story. We'll pick it up in verse five. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Here's what you need to know. Sometimes rest and refuel have to come before renewal may sound weird to you, but sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap and eat a snack. And all the tired moms and dads said amen. It might be that you need to address your physical needs before you tackle your spiritual needs. Years ago, I was at a conference and, and one of the leading youth pastors in the country was talking about soul care, about personal retreats. He said something that I found fascinating. He talked about taking a retreat to a monastery, getting away for a brief sabbatical. And he told us that the very first thing he did after he got settled into his room, the, the very first thing he did was take a nap. 
instead of pouring himself into the spiritual exercises ahead of him, instead of diving into the word and prayer, he took a nap. He let his body and his mind and his soul rest. Dan's been talking to us for more than a year about silence and solitude, about Sabbath and surrender, about being still. It's not just about doing more, reading more, praying more. Back in February, I was having a a dinner personal coaching session with my friend Turk. He was asking about uh, about my personal habits for recharging, how I was taking care of my soul. I told him, I get energized by being outside. So he said, okay, so what are you doing to pursue that? He asked if I was getting outside at least a little bit every day, maybe taking a walk. And I I said, no, I really didn't have time for that. So he pushed back. He said, what time do you get up every morning? I said, I get up about seven. He said, okay, well then why don't you get up at six and go for a a walk, go for a prayer walk every morning? I said, I cannot get up at six o'clock. I'm not a morning person and I want to get as much sleep as I can. He said, why can't you get up at six? What time do you go to bed? I said, for as long as I can remember, at least since college, I've been getting up, I've been going to bed about two o'clock in the morning. He said, Stace, I love you. You're an idiot. He said, I should go to bed earlier so that I could get up earlier. And you know what? He was right. I started going to bed about 11 o'clock and getting up every day at six to go for a walk through my neighborhood, praying, listening to the voice of God, starting my day with Jesus, and it's been so good. I tell you that story to to say that you can make changes right now. They might seem difficult, but you can make changes, and I wanna ask you, what could you do to be more proactive, to put yourself into a place of better overall health? Well, let's keep going with the story of Elijah. Let's look at verses 9 to 14, because while your most immediate need might be food or rest, everyone's ultimate need is a deep soul connection with God. Here's the truth. God wants to talk with you. Well, let's read. Uh, It says that Elijah came to a cave and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What are you doing here, Elijah? Question so important that God asks it twice. That's significant. God sees you when you're hurting. He cares about what's happening to you and in you. What are you doing here, Elijah? God asks an honest question. And he wants an honest response. So Elijah responds with this speech that he has rehearsed a thousand times, this script that he has practiced over and over in his mind. You can see that his hurt, his wound, shapes his words. He says, I've done 
the thing. I've, I've been, I've worked hard. I've risked. I've been obedient. And nobody else stood with me. And now I'm alone. And they're going to kill me. Don't you see this, God? Don't you care? I hope you can, I, I hope you realize that you can be real with God about your hurts, about your wounds, your fears, your disappointments. I, I want you to know that we don't have to be afraid that God's going to be angry with us. We don't have to be afraid of retribution or, or of his dismissal of us. God doesn't get upset. He listens and he responds. You're not going to hurt God's feelings with strong words or emotional outbursts. Our heavenly father is patient and kind. He's responsive and restorative. You see, when his heart was ready to hear, God spoke to Elijah. Oh, and Elijah had to get his words out. Uh, I think a lot of us probably think we'd like to ask God a few questions to give him a piece of our mind. We've got a list of grievances and we can rattle them off at the drop of a hat. Job had a script memorized too. Do you, do you remember Job's speech? Oh, I wish I could talk to God. I'd give him an earful. He repeatedly appeals to God, asking for a reason for his suffering, for his losses. Eventually in, in Job 23, we read, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. We want an answer from God, and the good news is that God wants to answer us. We could dig into this a lot more, but let me simply say this. Hearing God speak is what you need. And when God speaks, he invites you into an honest conversation. Having an honest conversation with God is good for our souls, and it ought to be our regular practice. So let me ask you, if you were to be totally honest, what would you say to God? And what do you think he'd say to you? Well, let's take a look at how God answers Elijah. In verses 15 to 18, we read this. The Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mahola you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall, put, shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God is so good to us. He refuses to let us stay stuck. He is the God of rest, refuel, and renewal. He tells Elijah, it's not over. I'm not done, and neither are you. We've got work to do. So go back to what I called you to do. And by the way, Elijah, your perspective's a little off because I've got thousands in Israel who are still true to me. God tells Elijah that his contribution to the kingdom, his role in restoration is not over. He says there's more work to do, and in fact, you're not alone. There are 7,000 other people in Israel who are still loyal to God, who are still standing against the false gods, the corrupt kings, against the evil powers of the day. How would it make you feel to hear God say, you're not done, you're not alone? God wants you to know that he's not done and neither are you. Whether the fault is ours or the deed was done to us, when we blow it or when someone brings the injustice to our doorstep, when we get discouraged and distressed, 
defeated and depressed, there's this ringing voice of accusation in our ears. Have you heard it? The devil is called the accuser of the brothers, and that's exactly what he does. He points out our sin. He continually brings up our flaws and our failures, the places where we've missed the mark. And if that's not bad enough, many of us have this nonstop inner voice, this monologue that runs all the time telling us that we don't measure up, that we failed before, and we're going to fail again, that we're disqualified. And don't even get me started on those people in our lives who can't wait to point out our mistakes and failures. But you know what? That's not the story that God tells Elijah. That's not the story that the Word of God tells us. When God speaks, the enemy has to shut his mouth. The devil can be persistent, but he cannot prevail. The inner critic can be verbose, but he cannot be victorious because Jesus is the truth. And when Jesus speaks, his love and power, his grace and authority, they win the day. The voice of Jesus can silence the inner critic, the contrarian, and the cursed enemy, the devil. So maybe you have blown it. We all have. You, you dropped the ball, you stepped out of bounds, you broke a confidence, you betrayed a trust, you missed the mark, and you feel terrible. Or maybe you're simply feeling like you're out of gas, like your tank is empty. You didn't end up where you thought you would. Your plans to be part of what God was doing have not worked out like you expected. You're discouraged, you feel defeated, weary, worn out, you're worried that maybe God's done with you. What do you think Jesus would say to you? My best bet is that it would sound a lot like what he said in Matthew chapter 11. At the end of this, this beautiful passage, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Here it is and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There is rest for our souls. Do, do you know the story of Peter's denial of Jesus? You, you probably do. You, you know how at the Last Supper, Jesus predicted that Peter would deny knowing him three times before the rooster crowed, and that's, that's exactly how things played out. Luke's account of this event tells us that as the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. They made eye contact. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Luke says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. He was broken. Can you put yourself in the place of Peter? How would you feel if you'd done the very thing that you swore you weren't going to do if you failed at the very moment you wanted to stand? Now, I've got to move quickly through this, but I can't leave Pete in the darkness because of his defeat. Because Jesus didn't dump him when he denied Jesus. In fact, after the resurrection, and, and somebody should cheer about the resurrection of Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus made a point to seek out Peter and work through some redemption and reconciliation, some rest, refuel, and renewal. Quickly, Peter and the other disciples were discouraged. They were defeated. Things did not go at all like they thought. They had done all the things that they felt like Jesus wanted them to do, and he died. Their dream died. Their larger-than-life larger leader was crucified and buried. And, and yes, Jesus rose from the dead, but Peter was still stinging over his denial. He was still carrying this burden, guilt, and shame from his failure. failure. John's gospel tells us that Peter and six other disciples were together by the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. Pete's wounded. He's carrying this immense burden so he goes back to the thing that he knows. Hey guys, I'm, I'm going fishing. They went with him and, and they fished all night and didn't catch a thing. Around daybreak, the sun's coming up. They see a guy standing on the shore and he, he calls out to them, Hey guys, did you catch any fish? 
Nope. Cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. They did. And they did. In fact, the net was so full that they couldn't haul it into the boat. The disciple Jesus loved said, it's the Lord. Peter dove into the water and he swam to shore and he made his way to Jesus. This kills me every time I I think about this story. When he got to the shore, he found Jesus with a little fire going. They cooked some of the fish. He shared breakfast with Jesus. After breakfast, Jesus walks through a healing, restorative conversation with Peter. Do you love me? Yes. Then feed my lambs. Three times they, they, they walk through that. Rest, refuel, and renewal. Peter blew it. Larger than, than you and I can imagine. Jesus met him in his brokenness. He met him in his mess. Because Jesus wasn't done with Peter. God wasn't done with Elijah. And God's not done with you either. We've all been there. Maybe you're feeling it right now, weary and worn out. Maybe you feel like you're at the end of your rope, like you don't have anything left in the tank and the race isn't over. I want you to learn the lesson from Elijah. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap, eat a snack. And when you've rested and refueled, when your heart is ready, God will speak with you. When that conversation happens, you'll hear Father say that he's not done, and neither are you. He'll invite you to open your eyes, to change your perspective, to repent where you need to, and to find his renewal. He offers you grace and mercy, a booster shot of courage and the kingdom. His mission is still your mission. You're not disqualified not out of the race. He's not done, and neither are you. If you stop and think, what's, what's the calling that Jesus wants to renew in you? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you that you are greater, stronger, more powerful, more patient, more loving than, than we could even imagine. I thank you that, that our failures aren't final because you have grace and mercy for us in our time of need and you invite us to come to you with boldness, to cast our cares on you, to find our strength in you. God, I thank you for this incredible promise of rest for our souls. So would you help us to take the steps that we can take and would you do the things that only you can do? Would you meet us? Help us to find rest and refuel and renewal. In Jesus' name, amen.